All right. Well, good morning, church. All right. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You didn't have to say that, but thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Marta Shea Gaston. I'm one of the members here at Pillar Church, and I want to welcome everyone. Um, lots of new faces here, and I want to give a shout out to some of my coworkers who actually came today. So I appreciate you guys coming through. Um, so before we get started, I just want to pray uh, before we begin. So if we could just bow our heads. I know uh, Derek prayed, but I always like to pray again. Can't have too much prayer. Father, I thank you for just this time and the privilege that it is to speak your word to your people. And I pray that when I stand here, God, that it is not me and it's not uh, just anything that I'm saying, God, but that it would be you and your words and that the Bible is what speaks and that is what you use to penetrate the hearts and the minds of the people here today, that hearts would be changed, souls would be changed, and um, that you would be glorified in all of this, Lord. So I um, pray that you would bless the word and bless this time. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So normally here at Pillar Church, again, I'm Marta Shea Gasson. I want to welcome everyone who's here, those who are watching online um, and streaming. Um, one of the members here at Pillar, and normally what we do at Pillar Church, we like to go uh, kind of book by book, uh, verse by verse, um, as we're preaching through different uh, books of the Bible. But today we'll be doing, I'll be doing a topical sermon. All right. So first thing. All right, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Which one do you guys want to hear first? Bad. The bad news. Okay, I thought you were going to say that. Even if you didn't, I was going to give you the bad news first. All right. So here's the bad news, all right? This is going to be a long sermon. Okay? But here's the good news. I'm joking. All right? All right. Shouldn't be that long. Okay? But we'll see. All right, so if you have your Bibles, open up to Psalm 90. And we're going to read verses 1 through 12. And then flip back a little bit to Psalm 39, um, and we'll be looking at verses 4 through 7. And I'll be reading it, so if you don't have a Bible, you can listen. Um, and I said flip, but a lot of you are going to scroll backwards to Psalm 39. So, um, so if you're flipping or scrolling, Psalm 90, verses 1 through 12, we'll read that first. And then the kind of bookmark Psalm 39, verses 4 through 7, and we'll read that as well. All right, so Psalm 90, verses 1 through 12. And if your Bible has um, headings, you'll see it says eternal God and mortal man as the title or something similar to that. Lord, you have been our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. You return mankind to the dust, saying, return descendants of Adam. For in your sight, a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by like a few hours of the night. You end their lives, they sleep. They are like grass that grows in the morning. In the morning, it sprouts and grows. By evening, it withers and dries up. For we are consumed by your anger. We are terrified by your wrath. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days ebb away under your wrath. We end our years like a sigh. Our lives last 70 years, or if we are strong, 80 years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? Your wrath matches the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. And if you flip back to Psalm 39, we'll look at verses 4 through 7. Verse 4, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days, so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long. And my lifespan is as nothing to you. Yes, every human stands, every human being stands as only a vapor. Yes, a person goes about like a mere shadow. Indeed, they rush around in vain. 
gathering possessions without knowing who will get them. Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Before we start, um, I want to ask you guys a question. Actually, before I do that, let me give you the outline of what we're going to talk about today. So the sermon's title, for some of you who take notes or write them down, uh, we're going to talk about death. Okay, And the title is Death, Think About It. And for the outline, we're going to have three sections that we're going to talk about. Okay, Just to make it easy, they all start with the letter R. Okay, So we're going to talk about the result of death, reactions to death, and the remedy for death. Okay, So the triple R's. Result of death, reactions to death, and the remedy for death. But before we begin any of that, I want to ask you guys a question. Okay, so here's the thing. What would you do if you knew you only had three months to live? All right. Imagine you were told you are not going to make it to see 2022. Okay. How would you live your life? Would you do anything differently? Would your life stay the same? All right. Like, seriously, I want you guys to think about that. Give you guys a second. I'm going to pause and I want you to think. What would you do? Would you make any changes? Would things continue to be the same? All right, so you've had a second to think about it. How many people, right, raise your hand, were like, oh, I'm going to work longer hours at work? <laughs> like that was your first thought. You're like, I'm going to work. I'm going to go to work early than tomorrow. I'm going to work some extra hours, right? Anybody? No? Maybe? Maybe? Okay. You love kids, so I guess. It's all right. I mean, I love kids, too, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> all right. So most of us, okay, except for the exceptionally wonderful few who would go in and work some extra hours because they love children, um, probably wouldn't do that, right? I think for a lot, of peop- a lot of us, we would maybe spend more time with our family, right? Um, we would maybe reconcile with somebody who we had an issue with or something like that. There are things that we would do. For some people, there's like, man, I got a bucket list and I'm going to you know, hit that up, right? I see some people smiling because that's what they thought about. They're like, you know, I want to go travel. I'm going to do this and that. You know, I'm going to go see them. I'm going to go bungee jumping, all right? And it's crazy, right? Because a lot of people have bucket lists and it's like you know, your bucket list is really like a death wish. They're like, I want to go bungee jumping and I want to climb, you know, a mountain and things like that. And it's like things that can actually bring you closer to death. Um, but, you know, and so tons of different things that people would do. Right. And I think a lot of it would involve people. Right. We want to whether it's our family, spouse, children um, or just going out and traveling and seeing the world, something we would do to spend those last few months that we would have. I think I've told some of you the story before. I know I've told some of my coworkers and, and friends. So do you guys remember Y2K? Okay, those of you who are like 20 and under, you probably have no idea what that is, okay? Because you were like just born, right? Yeah, you'd be 21 right now if you were born in the year 2000. So um, no shade, right? No shade. But in the year 2000, right? That's what Y2K stands for, year 2000, for you know, like my, my kids in the back and those in that age group. At that time, right, everybody thought the world was going to, like, end and crash, right? Because all the computer, were like, oh, the computers won't be able to handle the, the double zeros and, you know, things were going to mess up and, you know, the world was going to collapse and all computers were going to crash. So me, I was a senior in high school during that time, right? And in my brain, um, you know, this is the first semester of my senior year, I was like, oh, the world is ending, so I can stop doing schoolwork. <laughs> like, that's literally the thought that, that came across my mind. So no joke from like October to December, I was like, "Eh, the world's ending anyway. I can stop doing work so because it's not going to matter. Right. And that's literally what I did. Stop doing schoolwork. Grades suffer. And I was like, "Eh." and so, you know, it's 1999. Everything's counting down. Three, two, one. And I'm like, oh, okay. It didn't happen. I was like, man, I got to go to school the next day. (laughs) And so I had a lot of catching up to do in January of 2000. All right. Because I thought. This is it. The world is ending. I didn't have to do any schoolwork anymore. So I was probably one of the few people who was disappointed that the world didn't end in the year 2000. So I I share this story because, you know, most of us, as I said earlier, would do things differently if we knew that our time was coming to an end. 
See, most of us don't live like that, though. We think that our time isn't coming to an end. And that, that's the whole point of today's sermon. That's why the title is Death, Think About It, because I want to propose to you guys that we do need to be thinking about the end of our lives, because it's not this far away event that's like, oh, we, we've got plenty of time, it's down the road, right? Especially, I think the younger we are, we think we have more time, right? And the older we are, you know, we're kind of having a realization that, you know, our time is, is coming. We may not want to think about it, but it's, you know, we know it's coming the older we get, all right? I know it's like young people, you know, like my kids in the back, they probably think, ah, oh, yeah, I'll do this when I get older. But the Bible says, you know, we don't know that, right? If you go back and look at verse four, which is our focus for, um, sorry, verse 12. Psalm 90, verse 12, it says this, teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. And then Psalm 39, verse four, that's the other verse. It says, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short lived I am. See, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat things, right? It's going to tell us the reality of life and the way things actually are. You know, as humans, we want to, um, you know, gloss over things, ignore realities, right? Because I think in the back of our minds, we all know, like, hey, something can happen at any moment. You know, tomorrow is not promised. That's a, a phrase we hear often, right? Tomorrow is not promised. So we know that, but it's kind of in the back of our minds. But what I want to do today is bring that to the front of your mind today. I just finished reading this book that my children have recommended to me. It's called um, From Ant to Eagle. And it's a story of these two brothers. It's a really, really good book. It's really sad. Okay, but, you know, I'd recommend you guys read it. Or if you have kids, they can read it. It's a kid's book, but, you know, an adult can read it. It's a really good book. One of the quotes in that really stuck out to me. Now, like I said, it's these two brothers. One of them is really sick. Um, he has a terminal illness. And there's a line that stuck out when one of the boys says this, we're all dying. I'm dying. You're dying. The doctor's dying. Mom's dying. Some of us are just faster than others. And see, for some people, unfortunately, that whole three months question that I asked you, like that is their reality. You know, some people do know that their time is short whether it be through sickness, a terminal illness, or something like that. So that reality is made real for them. You know, for us, it was a hypothetical question that I just asked you guys, but for some people, that's their daily lived reality. But the thing is, it should also be for us. And that's what the Bible is teaching us today. The Bible wants us to number our days, to think about our end. And not in a, like a morbid way where you sit in a dark room, you shut all the lights off, and you're like, death, death, it's coming. Um, not like that, okay? Because <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> I don't know why that was funny, but it was. Um, but the reality is, you know, what we really need to be thinking about, it's not so much thinking about death, but what happens after that, okay? And that's what, I mean, the pages of the Bible are filled with examples and lessons and talking about death. So when that whole verse, when we read Psalm 90, right? reading through one, verses 1 through 12. You know, it tells us a couple of little things, right? It says that, verse 10, our lives last, you know, seven years, or if we are strong, 80 years, right? So for us, we think, man, that's kind of long, you know, someone who lives to 80 or 90. But when you compare that to eternity, okay, which is forever and ever and ever, 80 years is like a drop in the ocean, like a drop of water in the ocean compared to eternity, okay? Okay. Um, the Bible wants us to remember that we are weak, we are frail. A lot of times as humans, we think we're um, immortal, right, or invincible, right? Oh, nothing will happen to me, okay? You know, I, I can do anything, I can go anywhere. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times that gets shattered by reality. So the first thing I want to talk about is the result of death, okay? Because while death is something we don't normally think about, this is not the way God intended it to be from the beginning. So death was never the plan. Sin messed things up. If you guys know the story of Genesis chapter 3, all right, um, I think for most of us, if you've been in church, even if you haven't, all right, you've probably heard the story of Adam and Eve, first two human beings that God created. All right? Put them in this garden. The garden was perfect. They were perfect. Everything was good. There was a tree. God said, you can eat from any of the fruits, any of the trees out of here. 
don't touch this one. Don't eat it. Don't eat the fruit, not touch it. He didn't say don't touch it. He said, do not eat the fruit from this one tree, all right? There's hundreds of trees, but he said just this one. Don't eat the fruit from it. And of course, what do they do? They eat from it, okay? And that moment immediately destroyed God's perfect plan for them. Because he didn't create them to die. God made them eternal beings. Um, they were going to live forever and ever had they never touched that fruit, right? We'd all be in the garden, chilling, naked, but not knowing it, right? Because that, that's how God made them, okay? And that would have been our reality. But they ate the fruit. They brought sin into the world. And from that moment on, everything we see now has been messed up, right? We live in this world. There's pain. There's suffering, right? Death is all around us. This is a result of that. And, you know, I think for many of us, it's been brought to the forefront these past two years, right, with this pandemic. Um, and, you know, we've all maybe know someone who has died as a result of COVID. Or there's been different nat natural disasters that have happened, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, right, different injustices and shootings that have happened, um, mass shootings that have happened, wars, sickness, old age, accidents, just different things that have brought death to the forefront, where it's something that was in the back of our minds, but immediately, you know, I know many of you in here have lost a loved one, a family member, sister, brother, father, grandfather, or someone close. And that hurts. That hurts. Death is painful. But again, this was not the way God intended it to be. So this is the first thing, the result of death. Pain, suffering, sorrow, just a lot of pain and hurt. So when that happens, though, there's different reactions we can have to, to death. And so this is the second point. We'll either do one of three things, right? We're either going to ignore the reality of death, we're going to obsess over it, or there's a third option, which is we're going to think about it in the way that the Bible wants us to. Okay, so here's the first one. Ignore the reality of death. There's a phrase that I think most of you know, YOLO. You guys heard the word YOLO? You've heard that phrase before? YOLO, right? What does it stand for? You only live once, right? Everybody knows that. Drake even has a song about it called The Model, right? He's like, you already know, though. You only live once. That's the motto, okay? But YOLO didn't start, you know, with Drake or this current generation, right? There's been other phrases that are similar, but they all have that kind of same reality to it, right? You ever heard the phrase carpe diem? Seize the day, okay? Some people say no regrets. Some people say, well, you know what? Only God can judge me, all right? Because people are like, you know, I want to live my life how I want to live it. Um, and only God can judge me. And the crazy thing is the people who live as if only God can judge them, they live their lives as if God isn't going to judge them. So that's the thing. Most people, and that's us included. This is not something that's for people who aren't in the church. I mean, even us as Christians, a lot of time, we spend most of our lives living as if this reality of death is not going to happen to us. Um, there's this... A song by this artist named Timothy Brindle. I'm just going to quote a short section of it. He says this, while most spend the time of their life trying to have the time of their life, thinking lies are really true. If you're busy killing time, the truth is time is killing you. But you're too cool. You love to take your time. You fool. God can come and take your time. See, this is the reality. We like to ignore death as if it's just, like I said earlier, something far away that's at a distance. Um, you know, it won't happen to me, all right? Someone else, but not me. And so that's the first thing. A lot of us will ignore the reality of death, all right? We live by the motto YOLO, even if we won't say it out loud, but that's how our actions show. The second reaction that some people will have is to obsess over death, right? There are some people who live in fear of death. Right? Like, man, like, I'm scared to go out or, you know, just scared to live because death could happen. Okay? And so some people obsess over that. I remember um, there's a friend of mine who got into a car accident on the highway. And so after that, scared to drive again. Like, just driving became a fear because, like, well, what if something happens? What if something happens? And so it was, like, just something that shackled them from, from being able to drive, you know, just normally and regularly. All right? There are some people who have a fear of flying. Right? Um, 
even though there's more car accidents than you know plane crashes. But again, I get it because a plane crash is far worse than a car accident, right? But obsessing over death will not help either, right? We don't want to think too much about death or obsess over it to the point where it causes us to fear and not live the lives that God wants us to live. So neither one of those two things is good. We don't want to ignore the reality of it, but we also don't want to obsess over it. Here's what the Bible tells us to do, to think about death. And again, back to Psalm 90, verse 12. The Bible says to teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. And then Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. Why does the Bible want us to number our days? Both verses tell us that, to number the days, count the days, right? This is just like, hey, count your age. You know, every year, you know, you're 20, you're 22, you're 23, 24. That's not what it's talking about. The key part at the end of verse 12 is to develop wisdom. Because here's the thing. The Bible is constantly talking about making a comparison between fools and the wise. Okay? The fools will live as if there is no end. But the Bible wants us to live as wise people who know that, you know what, the end is going to come and that thus should shape how we live in the present. That's the whole point of thinking about death. It's not thinking about death as far as like, oh man, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? But it's so that it shapes how you live now. Because remember the question I asked you at the beginning, if you knew your life was going to end in a couple of months, what would you do? And for most of us, right, we would do things differently. We're like, oh, I would do this, I'd do that. But why don't we do those things now? Right? I remember when the pandemic hit and all of us are, you know, were locked in our homes, right? We couldn't go out, couldn't do things. And a lot of people at that time started like taking walks, you know, and doing, you know, enjoying nature. And like I remember my bike was broken, I went to the bike shop to get it fixed. And I mean they were all out of parts. They were like, it'll take us like months to get it fixed because so many people are now getting bicycles. Um, so many people, you know, were taking walks and like just stopping and realizing, like, man, you know, we need to enjoy life and people and people are having conversations with their families and, and things like that. So, and it was like, why did it take a pandemic for us to start doing these things? You know, and unfortunately, once we started getting back to normal, a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, went back to their normal ways and stopped doing all the healthy things that they were doing at that time. You know, but again, it took something like that to get people to kind of shift their thinking and start doing things differently. But again, that's what the Bible is constantly trying to help us remember. Like, hey, live differently. Our lives should not be lived just doing whatever we want, anytime we want, as if there's not something coming after that. Right? Here's another verse. Um, it's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. And here's what it says. It says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. So again, talking about wisdom, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So again, these verses are telling us to live our lives in light of being obedient to God, right? Serving other people, um, following the commandments of Jesus, um, living in the ways that God would want us to honor him, right? Not in wasteful spending, not in um, just any of the things that we would do if this life was it, right? The Apostle Paul talks about that. He says, you know, as, as Christians, if this life is all that there is, like if we just die and there's nothing that happens after that, you know, then it's like, hey, we're to be pitied, right? Because we would have done all this stuff serving God and it just ends at the end. But here's the thing, the flip side of that, though, is if Christianity is true and there is a life afterwards, right, then there will be some consequences if we don't live our lives in the way that God wants us to. And that's what Hebrews 9 verse 27 says. And I'll read it for you. It says this, and just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this judgment. So as I said earlier, it's not so much death that the Bible really wants us to think about. It's what comes after that? What's next? And the Bible is clear. There is judgment. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11, verse 9 says this. It says, Rejoice, young person, while you are young. Let your heart be glad in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in, in the desires of your eyes. Right? So it's like, do what you want, right? 
be young, be free, be wild, go crazy. But then it says this, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. Right? And so, again, the people that say, hey, only God can judge me. Well, yeah, the Bible is clear. God will judge you. Right? That is the reality. So how we live our lives now matters. It matters. And that is why we need to think about death. There's, um, there's this other book that I read recently. It's really good. This is not a promotion for this book or anything like that, but it's called um, The Gospel According to Satan. We did a book study, um, a book club recently, um, and several of you were in the book club with me, and you know, we read through this, and there's a section on here, and he actually titles it YOLO, right? It goes through different um, false things that people think, uh, even as Christians, and it tries to refute some of those with biblical truth. And I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from here because they're really relevant to what we're talking about now. All right. And so it's talking about like the devil and things that he wants us to believe. And it says this, what the devil absolutely doesn't want is for you to consider what comes after death. You only live once, YOLO, he insists, not simply as a seize the day motivational proverb, but as a theological dogmatism. He wants you to stop before you get to the last line of Ecclesiastes 9:11, when for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. You may think I'm overselling this, but... You only live once isn't only the motto of adolescent knuckleheads and adult thrill seekers. It's the motto of every man whose investment in the future is limited to his retirement plan and the material benefits he leaves to his family. It's the motto of every mom whose chief concern for her children is that they end up healthy in a good school or with a respectable spouse. It's the motto of every person who goes through life never thinking of what comes after their last breath. Dying isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. Dying after you die is the worst thing that can happen to you. The second death is far worse, infinitely worse than the first. Satan will do whatever is in his power to keep you from thinking about that. We are all going to die. Nobody gets out of this world alive. You may die with six-pack abs, still working on it, and a marathoner's endurance, but you will be worm food. And then you will kneel before a holy God who rises to judge what's become of your life. Did you waste it focusing on yourself, giving no thoughts to this moment? So that's what I want us to get to, is to think about that moment after your last breath. So here's the thing. And we're on the third R now, the remedy, right? So we've talked about the result of death, how death got into the world and why we're in this mess to begin with. We talked about the reactions to death, people's different reactions, right? We can ignore it, obsess over it, or do what the Bible actually tells us and think about it, live our lives according to it. But here's the remedy, okay? Make sure that you only die once. Right? So we talked about YOLO, right? You only live once. But here's another motto, right? It's lo till do. It's not as catchy as YOLO, but <laughs> all right? So lo till do. Okay. Here's what it is. Live once, die twice. Live twice, die once. Okay? I'm going to say it again. Live once, die twice. Live twice, die once. Okay? Put that on a t-shirt. I didn't come up with this, so it's not mine. All right. So here's the thing. Number one, if you are, a, if you are not a Christian, repent and believe in Jesus. Um, there's a famous verse you'll see that baseball games and football games and people hold up John 3.16, right? It's become so cliche, you know, people will just say it. But it's real and it's truth. And it says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said this when he was speaking to a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the rulers. Um, at the time, he was, I can't remember if he was a Pharisee or a Sadducee, but he was one of the religious leaders. And he came to Jesus and he was like, you know, and he came to him at, at the dark, right? Because he was scared of the other religious leaders. So he came at night to Jesus and he was like, hey, Jesus, come in. Right? And he was like, you know, I want to ask you some questions. So they're talking, they're talking, and Jesus says, listen, you have to be born again. 
And Nicodemus is like, born again? Like, I gotta go back in my mother's stomach and come out again? And Jesus is like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And that's when Jesus recites John 3.16 to him. Okay? And so this is what we need, because if we are born again, as the Bible says, that means we've put our trust in Jesus, we've repented of our sins, God will forgive us and give us new life. So we are born a second time. And that's what I mean by if you live if you live twice, you will die only once, because all those who put their faith in Jesus, after death comes eternal life. But if we don't do that, um, I'm going to read for you Revelation chapter 20. Because Revelation is the very last book in the Bible, and it tells us what's going to happen at the end. I'll read it for you from my Bible. All right, here's what it says. Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. And if your Bible has titles, it probably says the great white throne judgment. It says, then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Remember, the only God can judge me? He does that here. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Verse 14, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, these verses are, are harsh, but they're reality. And that's what the Bible teaches us happens after the first death. So this is what we mean by if you die, if you only live once, you will die twice. Because this is the second death that the Bible is referring to. Now, if you're a Christian, live your life in anticipation of eternity. Be wise, redeem the time, because listen, it will be worth it in the end. Listen, all of the suffering, all of the pain, all of the hurt, all the terrible things that we do not like about this life, they will be over one day. I'm going to read for you Revelation 21, verse 4. Here's what it says. He will wipe away, talking about Jesus, every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Let me say that again. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. And even in Revelation 20, it talked about that. It refers to death as sort of like a, can't think of the term, but... Um, a physical being that gets thrown into the lake of fire as well. One day Jesus is going to take care of death permanently. Death will no longer be this thing that we have to worry about, fight against, um, be sad about. The Bible says death will be no more. Death will be destroyed. Jesus has overcome death. So here's the thing. One day, every single one of us, our lives will come to an end. It could be decades from now, right? It could be years from now, months from now. It could be days from now. It could be hours from now. It could be minutes from now. We just don't know. And so this is why the Bible tells us to number our days, to pay careful attention to how we live now and to redeem the time. Because again, if we knew what was going to happen, right, most of us would live very different lives. But the reality is we should be living different lives because we don't know when that time is going to end. So we have to be using our time wisely now to serve the Lord, to trust in Jesus if we have not done that yet, and to live in light of this reality that eternity is calling, it's coming. Before we close, I want you guys to just close your eyes. I'm going to play this song. Um, it's by this Christian rapper called Jackie Hill Perry. Uh, the song is called Maranatha, um, and it means, Come, Lord Jesus. 
So just listen to the lyrics, um, and then we'll pray at the end, but just listen. You may not be able to catch all of it, but at the very end, it should be clear enough for you to hear what she's saying. I'll read while he's doing that. I'm just going to read the very end of what the song says. It says, How long I got to bear it in faith? How long before you carry my weight? How long before they bury me? Wait, how long before you take me away? It might be night, but the sun's coming back. S-O-N. It might be night, but the sun's coming back. Watch the time. Keep yourself on track. Keep yourself on track. And that's the very end of the song, just talking about everything we've been talking about. Keeping ourselves on track because the time is coming. The sun is coming back. Father, death is not an easy topic or thing to address because the reality of it is it's difficult. Lord, it's hard. Many of us have had to deal with that this year. But I pray that through this, you would let us see that there is hope on the other side. There is life on the other side because you, Jesus, have conquered death. You died to give us new life. And I pray that we would receive it, that we would trust in you. And for those of us who know you, that we would live our lives in light of that reality, God. That because we're fleeting, because our, as the Bible says, we are just a vapor, our time is just a mist on this earth, and it, it goes, it comes and it goes so quickly, Lord. So help us not waste the time that you've given to us, Lord. Let us make the most of it, to redeem it, to live wisely on this earth, living lives that will bring honor to you, that will serve those around us, um, that would bring healing and hope to the world around us, God. And because we know that death is not the end. And so we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.